Boitzvay, let's get started. We are in Daf Tzadi Vav and Aleph. Uh, because today is Rosh Chodesh, we're going to stop a couple lines short of the end of the Daf, just because we weren't able to finish it in the earlier Daf. But we're on the about the 11th line. Ozal. Ashkach Dapa Mitevusa de Noach. We're talking about Sancheriv and how he attempted to destroy all of Yerushalayim. He did succeed in a, to a very large degree in strongly weakening the Jewish people because he exiled the ten tribes, but he was not able to ultimately destroy Yerushalayim. And um, <clears throat> we learned previously about Agadita that talks about uh, Hashem in some way disguising him to allow him to masquerade his way into Eretz Yisrael. Azal Ashkach Dapa Mitevusa de Noach. Amar Hainu Elaka Rabba de Shizve Lenoach Mitufna. So he goes on his travels and he encounters a plank from the original Ark of Noach. It's now, timely. It's very timely. It's okay. this week's Parsha. The question is, why is Dafka this? But he says, Oh, this must be a sign that I am being countenanced by the God of the, the great flood. Uh, that saved Noah from a flood. And so, too, God will save me from any uh, 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 impending danger. Omar, ye ozolahu gavra, umatzlach mekariv luhu latrain benoe kamach. And he made a vow. He said, if I am successful in taking Jerusalem, then I will sacrifice my two sons before you, the God of the Jews. So shamu benohe vekatluhu. His sons heard about it, and they knocked him off. <laughs> so, which is, of course, the occupational hazard of making a pledge to sacrifice your sons. Hainu dirsiv, vayihu mishtacha ve'beis nasroch elohav, ve'adar melech v'sharatz arbanav, yiko'u becharav. And therefore the Pasuk narrates that he was in the midst of his idolatry, which was called nasroch, and apparently nasroch from the word neser could be a plank, you know, and that's why the Gemara understands it to be a, a plank from Noach's teva, and his sons assassinated him at that time. Next, we're seeing a related Gemara, uh, because we're transitioning now from a discussion of Sancheriv to a discussion of Nebuchadnezzar. But the way that we're going to get there is we're going to be discussing Avram Avinu and his ability to be, count, to be saved by Hashem when he went to war against the enemy. That remember the story in Parshas Lech Lecha, that when Avraham hears that his nephew Lot is taken captive, he goes to war against the four kings, and he he's, he runs pursues them in the in the midst of night, he and his servants and he smites strikes them down. So Amar Reb Yochanan also Malach Sheni Zdamilo LeAvram Laila Shema. That the word Lila doesn't just mean at night. It means that there was an angel that was assisting Avram by the name of Lila. And it was that angel that assisted him in smiting the four kings. Shenemar vahalila Omar Horagover. As the knight speaks and says that a man is with child, and um, or the man will give birth to child. And basically, um, the simple understanding is that what we're bringing from that Pasuk in Eov is that the, the, this word Lila is a speaking entity, meaning that it's an angel. Rabbi Yitzchak Nafcha has a different interpretation. He says the word Lila doesn't just mean night, like, like Rabbi Yochanan had said, but it means something different. It means that just like we find that in the times of Devorah and Barak and Sefer Shoftim, that Devorah sang a shira, and in that shira she said that all of the stars dislodged from their normal place to attack Sisra, that's what happened with Avram, is that he had the assistance of the night luminaries, that they actually also dislodged from their normal position, and helped in some way in attacking the four kings, just like Barak and Devorah had assistance from the stars to attack Sisra. Amar Reish Lakish, Tava de Nafcha midabar Nafcha. And Reish Lakish just comments and he says that the smith's pshat is better than the son of the smith's pshat. The smith is Rabbi Yitzchak Nafcha, he's a blacksmith. That's what the word Nafcha means. And I like his explanation better than Rabbi Yochanan's explanation, whose father was a blacksmith. By Yerdof Adon, the, the Pasuk also by Avraham says 
that he pursued un, un, until the territory of Dun, meaning he's going up north, right? So Amar Rabbi Yechanan, Kevin Sheba Osa Tzadik Adon Tashash Kocho, Ra Bnei Bonav Shasidin Lavod Avod Azara Bedan. That when Avraham was pursuing the enemy, when he got to the territory of Dun, he had a weakening of strength because he foresaw prophetically that his, de- that his future descendants from Shevet Dun would worship idols in that place. As it says by Yeravam, the, the evil king of Israel who set up idolatry, that he set up one of the golden calves that, he's, uh, that he created, he set up in the territory of Dun. And that wicked person, uh, it, which I believe we're still, are we still referring to Sancheriv? I believe so. We're saying that that wicked person, Sancheriv, also did not feel a sense of gevura, feel a sense of strength until he reached that place. As it says, let me just see this pasuk. As it says in Yirmiya, midan nishma nacharasusav. That from Dan it was you could hear the neighing of his horses. Amar Rebbe Zera, Afal Gav Desholach Rebbe Yeshua Ben Levi, he zaru bezakein sheshachach Talmudo Machmas Onso, vihizahu vihizaru bavridin karebi Yehuda, vihizaru bivnei ame haaret shemehente tzei Torah, ki hamilsa modiinan lehu. Now. We've now concluded our discussion of Sancheriv, <coughs> and we're now entering into a discussion of Nebuchadnezzar, who was a few generations after Sancheriv. And he is successful in destroying, unfortunately successful in destroying the temple. <coughs> and what Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi basically teaches as follows. He says, I'm sorry, the um, Rabbi Zeyre tells us, that even though Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi had taught us to be careful with the following three ish issues, we nevertheless have to state the following to the son of an Am Haaretz. Now let me just explain. We know from Chazal, from other places in the Gemara, that many times a person whose parents are Amaratzim rises to prominence as a leader in Klal Yisrael, as a Rosh Hashiva, as a great rabbinic leader, right? And part of it is because of the humility, because when a person's father is a Rosh Hashiva, sometimes the gaiva prevents him from rising to greatness. Mm-hmm. So many times Hashem allows the child of an Am Haaretz to rise to greatness and become a leader. Now, one of the three things that Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi had said was, you have to be careful with the honor of a child of an Am Haaretz. What are the three things that he said? He said, be careful with an elderly person who used to be a Talmud Chacham but has become senile. He said, be careful when you shecht uh, poultry to make sure that there are certain vridin, certain sinews that have to be severed as well at the time of Shechita in order to be able to make sure it's kosher. And also be careful with the descendants of Amaratzim, children of Amaratzim, because from them goes forth Torah. So even though the third thing that Rabbi Levi said, you have to be careful with their honor, nonetheless, you have to let them know the following. Now what the following is going to be, at least according to one shot in Rashi is, as we're going to see that um, uh, uh, people were notified that it is in the zuchus of their ancestry that they are able to succeed in certain areas in life. And even though you have to be careful with the honor of a Ben Am Haaretz, to make sure you give him proper kavod. But one of the things that you should tell him is that you would not be so successful were it not for some kind of schus avos that you must have. In other words, even though you may, your father may be an am haaretz, your mother may be an am haaretz, whatever the case may be, but there must be some zuchus in your family that allowed you to rise to prominence. You're not a self-made man. You're not, always, you're not a self-made man. In other words, even though you have to honor him, but also remind him that no one rises to prominence if on their own. There's always something in their great, background. Great, 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 great. Yeah. It could be whatever, right? What did Mishnah of Gemara talk about Amar? It's not talking about children of Jews. The Rashi brings yes. the Sancheirim, Haman, Shmai, Avtan, Vagerim. You'll see. You'll see. You'll see. You'll see in a minute. You'll see in a minute. Um, so Tzadik Atah Hashem. So we tell them the following. Now, this Pasuk... Once again, we're analyzing many psukim from Sefer Yirmiya. This also is some Sefer Yirmiya, where Yirmiya 
questions Hashem's righteousness because we don't understand why Hashem allows the wicked to prosper. Tzadik ato Hashem ki arive lecha ach mishpatim adaber osach maduach derech rishoyim tzolcha sholu kol bog devoge. He says to Hashem, he says, I understand that you're a righteous God, but I still must have a disputation with you. Why is it that sometimes we see that the righteous are prospering and being successful? So, and then he says, gam yelchu gam asuperi, that despite the fact that they mention your name, but they're really not serious, they're not, uh, they're not really not devoted to you, and yet they are able to plant, and their plants take root, and they're very successful in their agriculture and in all their walks of life. So that was the question that Yirmiya asked Hashem. But in the course of asking that question, Maya Hadrule, what is the response to the Navi's question, and in in later on in that very same parak, Ki es, uh, ki es raglim ratsta vayal ucha, this Pasuk is an allusion to various different wicked people who did righteous things that are in the background of people who are wicked themselves. Ki es raglim ratsta, because the feet ran forth. Now, as we'll see in a minute, this is a reference to the ancestor of... Of, um, of the wicked people that Yirmiya is, is talking about. It's a reference to Nebuchadnezzar, who started to run towards Eretz Yisrael. And Vayal Ucha, Veich Tischares Asusim, Uvaaret Shalom, Atovotech. All of these things in the Psukim are references to people who are ancestors of these Rishoyim, and this is the response. And so basically, <coughs> um, you, you run. But you run and you become weary. So therefore, how can you hope to be able to overtake the horses? That's really what the Pasuk says. So first of all, the Gemara explains the Pashib Shad and the Pasuk. There's a man who boasts as follows. He says, I can outrace uh, galloping horses who, and I can run past them for three parses, which is a very, that's like three parses, it's like uh, basically about 12 kilometers. And I can outpace them even when I'm running on swamp, swampy marsh. So, Nizdamelo ragli echad, rats lafan of gimel milin, biyabasha vinile. So then all of a sudden he is presented with the opportunity to run in front of a regular human being and is able to outpace the guy who's running. For three, kilo, for three mil, for like th- only three kilometers, and then he gets exhausted. So, Amrule, Uma Lifne Ragli, Kach, Lifne Asus, Malachas Kama Vekama, Uma Shloshes Milin Kach, Gimel Parsos, Alachas Kama Vekama, Uma Bayabosha Kach, Bin Bitse Hamai, Malachas Kama Vekama. So, we say to a guy, if you're pooped after running th- just three mils in front of a regular human being on dry land, well, then how much more so will you not be able to overtake? running horses for three, not mills, but three parses, which is four times the distance, on marshy land, which is much harder to maneuver. So if you're pooped already after running up in front of this guy, then there's no way that you're going to be able to outrun galloping horses. So, af ata, uma bischar arba pisio shashilamti la osa rasha sharatz achar kavodi ata tamia, keshani mishalm schar la avram yitzchak viyakov sharatz alfonai kisusim alachas kama vekama. So, what, what is this relevant to our discussion? Because we're saying basically as follows. He says, you're amazed that the wicked prosper, and why do they prosper? Because their zayda walked four steps in front of me. If that's the reason why their children, their descendants, are allowed to prosper because of just four steps that their Zayda took, then imagine what the great reward will be for those great tzaddikim in the Jewish people's ancestry who galloped like horses in front of Hashem. That's what the Pasuk is trying to portray. Basically, what Hashem is responding is, the wicked prosper in this world because of their ancestry, but imagine if the wicked prosper because of very poor ancestry, then imagine how much the Jews will prosper because of their rich ancestry. But not necessarily in this world. 
Not necessarily in this world. And that's why the Navi also says later on in Yirmiya that for those great prophets of Ram Yitzchak and Yaakov, my heart and body shake and in wonderment that I'm like a drunkard because of my great amazement of what will happen as a result of their righteousness to their descendants. So, honey dalat psios mahi. So, what are these four steps that we're referring to? Dirsiv ba'esahi sholach merodach baladon ben baladon, melech bovel sforim vegoimer. So, there's a pasuk in Yeshaya that says that when the, the, the uh, Babylonian ruler, who, as we'll see according to Jewish tradition, is the father of Nebuchadnezzar, he hears that King Chizkiyahu, who's one of the most righteous kings of the First Temple period, is deathly ill and has had a miraculous recovery. So he decides, he's inspired, and he decides to send him scrolls and gifts. That's what the Pasuk says. Mishum ki mincha. So the Gemara says, what was so remarkable a lot of people get sick and they recover. Why should a foreign king send gifts to Chizkiya just because he was sick and he recovered? So the Gemara answer is, Lidro Shamofe Sasher Haya Ba'aretz. And the answer is, is because his illness and recovery were not just personally for him. There was a miraculous phenomenon that occurred throughout nature when Chizkiyahu recovered. The Amr Rebbe Yochanan Osa Hayom Shemes Bo'acha Shteshos Haya. Because when the wicked king Achaz died, Hashem shortened the day and only allowed for two hours of daylight. He, he shortened the day. Instead of 12 hours of daylight, Hashem only allowed for two hours of daylight. Why? Because he didn't want there to be time to make a nice levaya and a hespid. He felt that that Russia, Achaz, should not get a proper hespid, <coughs> should not get a proper eulogy and burial. But Hashem had to restore the sunlight sometime in order to create the balance in the, in, the, uh, in the celestial realm. So he restored those missing 10 hours of daylight on the day that Chizkiyahu was healed from his illness. Hashem made an extraordinarily long day, I guess, to delineate that this is a time of rejoicing. And this is the Pasuk in Yeshaya that seems to allude to that, that Hashem says, I will restore the shade that was placed in the times of Achaz, and I will compensate the sunlight in the times of Chizkiyo. Amr le Maihi, it's my high. So uh, B- Baladon uh, says to his, uh, Merodach Baladon <coughs> says to his officers, he says, what's going on? Why is the day 22 hours instead of 12 hours? So So they told him it's because of King Hezekiah. He got sick and he miraculously was re- recovered. So he says, how could there be such a person that and I should not acknowledge him? In other words, if he is so great that the, the entire sun uh, shifts because of his, of his, of his virtue, then of course I have to acknowledge that. So I, he said, write, he said, calls his scribes, he says, I want you to write down the following message. Write down, peace unto you, King Chizkiah, peace unto the city of Jerusalem, and peace unto your great God. So, Nebuchadnezzar, Safre de Baladan Hava, Hahi Shaita lo Hava Hasam, Ki Asa Amr Lehu, Hechi Kasvisu, Amr Lehi, Hachi Kasvinan, and so Nebuchadnezzar, is the scribe, and again, I told you that according to other traditions, he was the son of Balad, Merodach Baladon, but he's also, according to the Gemara, the scribe of Merodach Baladon. He was not there at the time. And uh, so he comes, and he sees that there's a scroll that's been prepared by other scribes. And he says, well, what does it say? So they said, oh, it, we wrote it as follows. They said, peace unto you, Chizkiya, peace unto the city of Jerusalem, peace unto your God. And he says to them, Amr lehu karisulei ela karaba vekasvisulei lebasov. Amar ela hachi kasuvu shlam le ela karaba shlam le karta di Yerushalayim shlam le malka chizkiya. He says to them, How could you put the God of chizkiya at the end of the list? 
If you're calling him the great God and you're acknowledging that he's responsible for the miracles, you have to put him first on the list. So therefore reverse it and say, peace unto the God, peace unto the city of Jerusalem, and peace unto you, Chizkiah. So Amri Lei Karyana de Igrisa Iu Lihavi Parvanka. So they said to him, it's a famous phrase, they said to basically, the person who reads the letter should deliver the letter. In other words, if you started with the solution, you should finish off. They said, okay, so then you should deliver this letter to Chizkia. So Rahat Basrei Kidaroit Arba Pesios Asa Gavriel Ve'ukme. So he starts to run, to run to Yerushalayim. He takes four steps, and the Malach Gavriel stops him. Can't, so that he's like he's frozen. He can't walk any further. So Amar Rabbi Yechanan Imoli Bo Gavriel Vehemido Lo Haya Takano L'Sonayim Shel Yisrael. Were it not for the fact that Gavriel stopped Nebuchadnezzar, right? He would have had so much zechus, the Jewish people would have been utterly annihilated by Nebuchadnezzar, and that's why Gavriel stopped him because he didn't want him to have so much zechus. So my Baladan Ben Baladan. Why is now this King Merodach Baladan called Baladan, son of Baladan? Normally we don't name a person after his father. So the Gemara explains, Amri Baladan Malka Hava V'ishtene Ape V'havi Ki Dekalba Hava Yosef Berei Al Malchusa Ki Hava Ksiv Hava Ksiv Shmei Ushmei Deavua Baladan Malka So the, uh, the Gemara tells us that something very bizarre happened. Merodach Baladan's father was also a king, and his name was Baladan. And his Merodach Baladan's name was probably either just Merodach, or maybe it was some other name. Maybe it was just, you know, Jim or whatever. But the point is that Baladan, the father, had some kind of strange thing happen to him that his face overnight turned into a dog face. Like he developed a face that looked like a dog. And so he had to be dethroned, because how can you remain king when you look like a dog? So his son took over for him, and, and in order to show honor to his father who had been deposed, he called himself Baladan, the son of Baladan. He, knows, he assumed his father's name. So So that's why the Pasuk says that a son will show honor to his father, and a servant will show honor to his master. And this is in, all in reference to what's going on at the time of the Churban. So Ben Yechabed Av had the Amron, Ve'eved Adonav Dixiv of Achodesh Achamishi Be'asar Lachodesh Ishnas Chas Reishana Lemelech Nevuchad Netzar Melech Bavel Banavuz Radan Rav Tabachim Amad Lifnei Melech Bavel Birushalayim by Yisrof Esbeis Hashem Vesbeis Amelech. So the first part of the pasuk we know we know refers to Merodach Baladan showing honor to his father. The second part of the pasuk says that a servant shall show honor to his master. This refers to Nevuz Radan the general of Nebuchadnezzar, who, according to the Pasuk, lay siege to Jerusalem and burned it down at, uh, when he was in front of his king, Nebuchadnezzar. So the Gemara asks the question, we turn the page, Umi Salik Nebuchadnezzar, Lirushalayim, Vaxi Vayalu Asuel Melech Bovel Rivlasa. Since when could Nebuz Radan burn down the temple in the presence of Nebuchadnezzar? That would place Nebuchadnezzar in Yerushalayim at the time of the Chorban, but we know he wasn't there. We know that he was in, Riv, in a place called Rivla, which was outside of Yerushalayim, because the king of Israel was taken in chains to Nebuchadnezzar in exile. So, so therefore, how do you reconcile it? So, Nebuchadnezzar was in a place called Antuchia, outside of Eretz Yisrael. So, Rav Chistav, Rav Yitzchak, Bar Avudi, Michal Omer, Demus, Duyukno, Haisa, Chakukalo, so two different opinions. One says that the image of Nebuchadnezzar was engraved in the Vuzradan's chariot, and the other one says that he had so much awe of his king that it was as if Nebuchadnezzar was Mamish standing there at the time when he performed his act of destruction. But the point is, is that this is the reference of the Pasuk of that a servant will show great honor to his master. That Nevuzradan transported with him 300 donkeys laden with battering rams that were designed to break down the walls and the, the gates, the iron gates of Jerusalem. So Nebuchadnezzar sends these supplies of battering rams to, to Nevuzradan. 
and Kulu Bal Itinu Chadasha di Yerushalayim. But he takes all of these hammers, they're described like hammers, according to Rashi, battering hammers, and they, the, the gate, the first gate of Jerusalem that they encountered was so strong and powerful that all of these hammers were broken by the very first gate. And so Nebuz Radan is starting to say to himself, hey, I don't think this siege is going to come, work out so well. Shenemar pitucheha yachad bakashil halumun that it says that all of the uh, hammers are swallowed up by the, by the gate. But boy, let me hader. So he thought, maybe I need to turn around and call this whole thing off. So Amar mistafina de loli avdu biki echdi avdu He says, I'm worried that they shouldn't do to me. I don't want to be assassinated like Sancherev was and, and suffer an ignoble defeat. So nafka kala va'amar shavar bar shavar nevuzradan shavar demat zimna demikta shachari ve'echala mikli. So a heavenly voice cries out and says, uh, the skipper, son of the skipper. In other words, you're, you're jumping forth and you're going to be able to be successful, Nevuz Radan. The time has come for the temple to be destroyed. Five minutes ago, when all of your battering hammers broke, it was premature. But now the time has arrived and you will not encounter any further obstruction. So, Pash Lechad Narga Asamachia Bekupa Ve'iftach. So he had only one battering hammer left. And he takes the back of it, the back of the hammer, and bangs on the, the next door that he finds, and all of a sudden the gate crumbles. So this is a sign that everything is happening by Hashem's direction. Shenamar Yodeya Kemevi Lamaila Basavach Eitz Kardumos. That as the Pusik seems to imply that the Yodeya Hashem himself is causing the gate to, to break with just the back of the axe. So he's, he continues walking through Yerushalayim and kills everyone he sees in sight until he comes to the covered portion of the temple and he ignites it. So Gava Hechala Darchu Bey Min Shemaya. The Hechal, the, the structure, started to levitate and try to escape up to the heavens. And yet the celestial beings down in heaven trampled it and forced it back down. This is, all, of course, all metaphorical. Shinamar, Gaz Darach Hashem Lebesulas Bas Yudah, that God has trampled the Virgin of Judah, meaning the Temple, and made it stay down so that it could be destroyed. Kazicha Daite, Nafka Baskala Vamrele, Amaketila Katla, Sechala Kalya Kolis, Kimcha Techina Techinas. So Nevuzradan at this point starts to become a little bit prideful uh, that he's so easily able to defeat Jerusalem. And at this point, again, a heavenly voice comes forward and says that uh, don't be so uh, arrogant because you're killing a dead people that have already been killed, you're destroying an already burned down temple, and you're grinding flour that has already been ground. Meaning, this is not, you're not the one who's doing it. I'm Hashem who's already made the decree. Shenemar kechi rechaim v'tachani kemach galit samasei choshpi shoval galisho kivri naharos that is, the Pasuk says in reference to going into exile, <laughs> grind up your flour and lift up your, um, your britches so that you can wade through the river because you're going into exile. And the point being is that chitim lo nemar elakemach. It doesn't say in the Pasuk, grind up wheat. It says grind up flour because basically this is what the cast, the dye has already been cast. So chaza damye de zechare to have a karasach. Amr lohu hai. Then he gets into the temple, and he sees this bubbling blood at some place in the Hechel. And he says to the people, the Jews that are around, he says, why is this blood, what's so, this is a very, we say this in one of the kinas in uh, on Tisha B'av. And he, he says to them, what is this bubbling blood, what's going on? So Amrulei dam zavachim hu Oh, they say, oh, it's nothing, it's just, uh, must be from a, a previous sacrifice, some of the blood spilled. So Amr lehu, I see va'ansi. Imedamu, kasi idmu. So he said, well, let me uh, see if this really is animal blood. Uh, so he goes and he slaughters an animal, and he sees that the blood is not similar at all. It's a different shade, a different mm-hmm. texture, whatever it is. So Amr lohu galili v'ilo sarikna l'chul l'bisraichu b'masreika de parzala. He says, I demand that you tell me what the real story about this blood is, and if not... I will torture you by tearing off with gold, with iron rakes the skin off of your body. 
So Amru Lei Hai Koin Venavihu De Invi Luhuli Yisrael Bechorbena De Yerushalayim Vekatlu. They said, "Okay, you got us." This is the prophet Zechariah. He had prophesied to us that we need to do tshuva because the Chorban is coming. We were so incensed with his prophecy that, uh, and he was a Kohen, and we, we killed him because we didn't like what he had to say. Okay, so Amr Lahu, that's why rabbis have to be careful because they could get, uh, you know, if they say something that whack. people are not happy with, they could get whacked. That's right. Amr Lahu, Ana Mephaisanale. I see Rabbanon katil aluya v'lo nach. I see Dardiki devei Rav katil aluya v'lo nach. I see Pirchei Kahuna katil aluya v'lo nach. Adi katil aluya tishin varba aribo v'lo nach. So he said, you know what? I will appease Zechariah's blood so that he can rest in peace. And he goes ahead and he takes the Talmidei Chachamim and he kills them. But the blood doesn't stop. He brings the little children in the cheder and he kills them and the blood does not stop. He brings the young Kohanim and kills them, and the blood does not stop. And he kills, he ends up killing 940,000 people. I don't know what the significance of this number is, but it's a mitzvah to find out what it is. And Karav <laughs> Lagabe, and so basically, when nothing's happening, he finally approaches the blood and Omar Zachariah Zachariah Toivim Shevahem Ivaditim Nichalach Dikatlinu Lakulu, Miyad Nach. Uh, so he says, Zechariah, I says, I've killed the best of the Jews. You want me to kill all of them? And at that moment, the blood came to arrest, stopped bubbling, and that was a sign that Zechariah was finally fine, able to find sort of uh, his respite, to find that, his, that he had been avenged. So here, here, tshuva b'dayte, omer mahim shalo ivdu ele nefesh echas kach, ahu gavra mati havi ale, arak shadar portisa lebeisei v'izgayer. So he, at that moment, he started to think about thoughts of tshuva. He says, he says, if the Jews of this generation only killed one righteous person and look at what their fate was, and look what the vengeance was against them, then I, who have killed so many righteous people, imagine what the vengeance will be against me. And immediately he wrote uh, words to his family, to like, like his last will and testament to his family, and basically said, take my estate, and then he went and Megayer became a Gert Tzedek. Tanu Rabbana Naamon Gert Toishav Haya, Nevuzradan Gert Tzedek Haya. So the Brisa tells us that Naamon, that was cured by Elisha in the Jordan River, became a righteous Gentile, meaning he never converted formally to Judaism, but he eschewed idolatry. Nevuzradan actually became a full fledged Gert. Mibnei Banav shall San Sisra lamdu Torah Birushalayim, Mibnei Banav shall San Cherev limdu Torah Birabim, Amaninu Shmai Vav Talion, Mibnei Banav shall Haman lamdu Torah Mibnei Bivnei Brak. He says that the des- descendants of Sisra learned Torah in Jerusalem. The descendants of San Cherev taught Torah publicly, and they were Shmai Vav Talion. And the descendants of Haman studied Torah in Bnei Brak. I could say a lot of jokes, but I won't. Vaaf mi bnei banav shel osa rasha bikesh hakadosh baruch hu lachnis and tachas kan feyashchina, and even the descendants of that wicked man Nebuchadnezzar wanted Hashem wanted to bring them under the wings of the divine presence because ultimately, part of the perfection of the world is for Hashem to take all of the evil and convert it into goodness, and so Hashem wanted to take the descendants of these truly evil people and turn them into goodness. But it was not meant to be because Amru Malachi Asher is Lifnei Hakadosh Baruch Hu Ribono Shel Olam Misha Hecher Eves Beisecha Vesarv Eisechalecha Tachnis Tachas Kanfe Yashchina. The angels cry out and says, "Hashem, you can't do that." He says, "The person who destroyed the temple and the glory of the Jewish people, how can you allow there to be some kind of of uh, uh, silver lining to that and allow his children to become gay?" So Haino Dixiv Rifainu Es Bavel Velo Nirfasa that Hashem sought to heal or to cure Bavel and was not allowed to by the Malachim themselves. Ula Omar Zed Nebuchad Netzar, Rabbi Shmuel Omar, Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmeni Omar Elu Naros Bavel, the Tirgama did see Naisu de Bavloi. So there's different interpretations about what it means that Bavel was never cured. Ula says it refers to Nebuchad Netzar, that his descendants were never allowed to become Gerim. Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmeni says it refers to the water of the Babylonian river, um, the, the, the rivers of Babylon, their waters are not sweet, and they were never allowed to be sweetened. And they translate that to mean that the date palms that grow by the waters of the Babylonian rivers 
they're, the dates are not sweet, they're bitter because of the bitter waters. Omar Ula, Amor Moab, Shivavi Bisha di Rushalem Havu, Kevin de Shaminu Lin Navie de Kamisnavi, Lukurbana di Rushalem, Sholchul and Avuchad Nazar, Puk Vita. Amon and Moab were very bad neighbors of the Jews. Once they heard the Nevi'im say that Hashem is going to destroy Jerusalem, they sent a letter to Nebuchadnezzar saying, Hey man, the coast is clear, you can come and destroy, because the Nevi'im have already prophesied as such. So Nebuchadnezzar says, I'm scared that, what, that I'll die like Sancheru who came before me. In other words, who's to say that I'll be successful? So Sholchuleik, he ain't ha'ish beveisa. So you take out the next three words because that's part of the next piece of Gemara. So they said there's a pas they cite a pasuk and this pasuk is um, is from Mishlei. They said the man is not in his house, right? They're referring to Hashem as it says Hashem is the man of war. So Sholach lehu bekrevahu vaasi. But Nebuchadnezzar says, okay, he's left, but he may be very close by, and as soon as he sees me trying to destroy Jerusalem, he'll come back. So, that's the next part of the Pasuk. No, you have nothing to worry, he's gone very far. But wait a minute, even if Hashem is distant, but if he sees me destroying the righteous of Jerusalem, Hashem will hear their cries and he'll come right back. So, so they cited the following Pasuk for him. The Pasuk says, again in Mishle, that the bundle of silver he has taken in his hand, meaning that Hashem has taken all of the righteous with him out of Jerusalem, so you have nothing to fear. Because silver refers to tzaddikim, as it says that God says, I have purchased for myself on the 15th of the month, Referring to the 15th of Nisan, when I did the Geula from Mitzrayim on Pesach, I have taken with me all of the silver out of Egypt. And Hashem describes this as Chomer Saorim and Lesech Saorim. What is a Chomer and a Lesech? It's a Kur and a half a Kur. A Kur is 30 Saas, and a Lesech is 15 Saas. And Rashi says this is a reference to the, the you, you've heard of the Lamed Vav Tzadikim. So according to the Gemara, at least according to the Bavli, this really, there's really 45 righteous people, 30 and 15. There's either 30 in, Jer- in Israel and 15 in Chutz Laaretz, or 15 in Is- Eretz Israel and 30 in Chutz Laaretz in every generation. And sometimes Hashem says, I've taken them with me. I've taken them, I've, t- I've brought them towards me. So Shalach Luhu, basically they're telling the Vuchadnetzah the coast is clear. So Shalach Luhu, Hadri Rishi, Bichuva, Bo Rachmi, Maisilei. So, but Nebuchadnezzar is still uh, resistant because he says, maybe the wicked in Jerusalem will do tshuva, and they, then, then, then they, as Bali tshuva, will call out to Hashem, and he'll save them. So, Shalchu Leik of our Kavala and Zman, Shenemar Layom HaKesa Yavo Beso, and Ein Kesa El Zman, Shenemar Bakesa Layom Chagenu. So, they once again quote him the Pasuk from Mishlei, which says that at the allotted time he will return which means that Hashem has already decided it's time for the temple to be destroyed, and He's not coming back until an allotted time, because the word kesa means an allotted time. As it says, ba kesa liyom chagenu, like we say by Rosh Hashanah, it's the allotted, allotted holiday. Sholach luhu sisfahu v'lo matzina da'asi mitalgu mimitra. But then Nebuchadnezzar says, okay, fine, but it's winter now, and how am I going to be able to besiege Jerusalem? How am I going to get there with all the snow and the rain? So, Sholchu Lei Ta Ashina de Tura, Shnemar Sholchu Kar Moshel Eretz Misela Midbara, El Har Bas Tzion. They said to him, Well, travel by the foot of all of the mountains between here and, uh, and Eretz Yisrael, because if you travel by the feet of the mountain, you'll be protected from the elements by the large mountains that will give you the, the cover. Fine, and, they, and the Gemara cites a Pasuk to cite that when Nebuchadnezzar came to Tzion, he came by the fi- by the foot of the mountains. So Shalach Lahu Yasina Lesli Duchta Diasvina Diasivna Be. But then he said, I have another objection. He says, once I get to Jerusalem, it's going to be cold. The elements were going to be exposed. Where am I going to put all my troops? There's no place for them to reside. So Shalchu Le Kivaro Shalahem Mu'ulin Mi Paltirin Shalach Dhsiv, Ba'e Sahinu Um Hashem Yotsiya Satsmos Malche Yudav as Atmos Saravi as Atmos Akohanim. 
Vishotchum Lashemesh Vilaya Khulakholtsa Vahashamayim Ashir Ahavum Vashir Avadum Vashir Halakhu Acharehem. And they said to him, No, you have plenty of places to reside because the burial caves of the Jews are more spacious than even your palaces in Bavel. And that's why the Pasik says that at the allotted time of the time of the Khurban, they will take out all of the bony remains of the Jews who were buried in these burial caves in order to make room for the platoons of soldiers of Nebuchadnezzar to reside therein. And their bones will be then scattered uh, in, uh, on the face of the earth in the presence of the sun and the moon and, the, and, and, and all of the hosts of heaven. And anyway, that's what it's basically saying, is that Nebuchadnezzar was finally convinced that it was time to come and take, uh, take Yerushalayim. So we'll have to hold it here for today, two lines from the bottom. And I wish you a good Chaydash and a good Nair of Shabbos. Anyone saying Kaddish?